It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Monday, January 22nd, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high-quality content that is going to talk about that 11-7 lineup, for us. Once again, we will bring it up. Yeah, it, it had a lot to do with the two losses this weekend. We're going to dig into that. Plus, it's Monday, so we will have our nemesis of the week all on today's show. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, and thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on the app formerly known as Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here, as always, with Russ Cohen, who's on all your favorite social media apps at Sportsology. We are at Locked On Flyers on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, and Twitter as well. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. You can find us over on YouTube or on the SiriusXM app. Or anywhere you listen to podcasts, subscribe to get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, Russ, before we dig into this 11-7 conversation, because I really want to dig into it, but uh, unfortunately, Owen Tippett got hurt in that yeah. game against the Avs. Um, he's been so hot. And um, uh, so far, what we know is that it's only day to day. Do you think it would be wise to sit him out regardless through the break? I mean, I'm I'm leaning towards that because the way um, I saw him limping off and then not being able to do much else, don't I don't see the the sense in bringing him back early for a game or two. And I'm not saying it's early. They know what the I don't know what the exact results are, but the right. rest would certainly do him good. I understand the team's going to miss him, but. That's the kind of thing you don't want an ankle to start, you know, barking again right after the break. So if he's out another game, it's something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, there's only three games left right. uh, before the all star break. So I think caution might be the better option here. But uh, speaking about those two losses for the Flyers back to back this weekend versus the Avs and the Sens. Uh, really wanted to dig into this 11-7 lineup situation because we talked about it pretty extensively in our preview of the game against the Avalanche in particular and why it would not be a good method to go with versus this team. And I kind of want to reiterate that. Are because we did that, what, two days in advance of that game? Yeah, I think we talked about it on fr- on Friday's show. We talked about it, you know, we re- recorded yeah. on Thursday, but, right. you know. No, but that's I, the whole, whole thing I'm trying to let people know. We, you know, we did it two days in advance of the show, so it wasn't like something like we were going to pile on or just do at the last minute. You know, it's something that had been, you know, thought out. Yeah, absolutely. And at least from my perspective, one of the main reasons to not use 11-7 against the Colorado Avalanche is just because of how skilled they are. And when you're trying to get the matchups that you want, you need some consistency and you can't be rotating pairs or forward lines. Uh, You really, especially in a home game when you have first change, you know, or last change, excuse me. I, I think that it's especially important that you get those specific matchups that you need. Yeah, I mean, the first thing right off the top was it was Sandheim's worst game of the year. Travis Sandheim was a minus four. So that was something that, that stood out. But that wasn't really the reason that had gotten them. What had gotten them was when you do that, you're shortening up your forward, your forward group, and the forward group just couldn't keep up with Colorado's forward right. group. They just couldn't. Uh, and and that's really where they get burned. You know, it's like, yes, the defensemen get like these spread out minutes, which is great for them, but it's bad for the forwards. And the, and Colorado has a load, of, like we said, three lines of solid forwards that could kill you like Miles Wood, like, you know, how he always kills the Flyers. He got an assist in that game. Some of these things were, you know, things that you've seen before. 
Right. And I think that was the other big part of it. I think Russ is, is the shortening of the forward bench because not yeah. only can you not get the exact matchups consistently, but you have tired legs on the forward side. Right. And the way that the Flyers have been playing defense this year is a team defense where everybody gets involved. And when your forwards can't keep up, then the neutral zone becomes less useful to you than it has been. I think that's been one of the best parts of the Flyers defense this season. And when they're successful is they can clog up the neutral zone a little better and create opportunities to take the puck the other way or drive the other team to the outside and have just a more effective defensive structure. But when the forwards can't keep up, they can't be a part of that structure. And you you leave kind of your defensemen out to dry to have to do it by themselves. Yeah, I mean, you know, McKinnon's always going to have some plays through the neutral zone, but he had five points. Like, so you, you de- he definitely didn't have to have a five-point game. So, right. you know, that's something where you look at it and you say, all right, yeah, that that was a bit of a failing. Look, Carter Hart had one bad goal. That's the way I saw it. If you want to say two, okay, I'll give you even two. Would I have pulled him? No, I wouldn't have pulled him because – I knew Sam Erson was going to play the other end of the back-to-back, and I knew that third period is going to be hard because it's hard when a goalie has to come in knowing he can't make a mistake and try and lead his, you know, bring his team back. That's a big mental gas for a goalie, and that right, you know, and that's something where they should have just said, you know, we're just going to have to leave Carter in for this one. And I get it, the Flyers did fight back, but it didn't work out. And then now all of a sudden you've, you know you've put Urson into another game where he had to mentally expend some energy and then had to start the next game. Right. But this all circles back to the 11, seven, right? Because part, because it puts Carter Hart in a more vulnerable situation, right? Which creates better opportunities for the opposing team, which then makes the goaltender have to work harder and is more likely to make errors because they're facing more and better shots. When all yeah, I mean, done. I had thrown up the stat uh, on their first 15 shots. The Avalanche had 13 scoring chances and five high danger. So it didn't matter that they only had 15 shots. What mattered were the last two things I said. Right. And and then, you know, when you look at at using the 11 seven again versus Ottawa, I, I think that the main part of the problem here is that under normal circumstances, you could have a random game against Ottawa and use 11-7. Right. Like it's not inherent to the nature of an 11-7 structure, but in this circumstance, it was not a great choice because they were already tired from having to do it the day before. Right. On a back-to-back, it wasn't advisable. You had fresh legs with Brink on the bench. You could have brought up a, a, a slew of people, a choice of Three forwards at least from Lehigh. It's close. That's why Lehigh is close. So you can bring up somebody. You really could have had some fresh legs for this game. But part of the issue with this and the 11 7 for this one is you heard John Tortorella say it in his post game. I believe in this group. That is his stubborn way of saying he's not going to do too much to change this up because he believes they'll come out of it. And it's like, okay, but at some point you do have to look at it realistically and say all right there there were some tired legs that third period the flyers yep. were running on fumes their guys were running on fumes absolutely that that third period was pretty rough for the flyers overall yeah. and you could you could absolutely see it and you're right i mean things could work out great and they could get back on the horse and everything's yeah. fine like that is absolutely possible sure. and certainly we hope so uh, for, for the team but I, I think that it's also just important to note that this decision affected how the flyers could and did play these two games and we saw you know very different beginnings to both of these games but similar endings and i, I think that's kind of where the 117 netted out yeah, I think so. I mean, again, it's kind of like you won 11-7, you lost with it. What made you go with it again? What was the the reasoning? You know what I mean? Like, we'll never know. And so, but it's just, like, I just don't see what the plus was going to be on the end on the end of a back-to-back. 
And we also did talk about a bigger goalie in Mad Sogard, and that was going to cause some problems. Now, look, they got a couple of early goals, <clears throat> you know, Zamula did. And, you know, one of them was a weird one. One of them was a great one. Um, and they kind of went away from that plan. And, and Ottawa did a good job. They clogged up the middle. And then all of a sudden when guys were trying to go on the edges – of the net and trying to, you know, get in pucks. You're trying to do it on a six foot seven guy, which we talked about um, yep. a couple of days ago. It's hard to do. And I'm not telling you Mad Sogard's a superstar, but I'm just telling you he's a big man. And that right. changes the way you, your game is when you face a goalie like that and you're not used to it. Right. Exactly. Um, speaking of Zamula, I, I do want to talk about his place in the lineup related to this 11 seven structure, because I think the assumption here can be that he's the number seven defenseman here, which he is in some ways in terms of the pecking order um, here, but that he doesn't have to be. He could be one of your top six and you could have a 12-6 lineup here. Of course. That he has earned that. And it's just not being, he's not being used that way. And it's a choice. It's, you know, I'm not going to put a value judgment on it, but it's a choice. It's it's not leaving Zamula out of the picture when you go 12-6. It's choosing to leave Zamula out of the picture if you go 12-6. Well, this is born out of like the coach's stubbornness to not want to break up Walker and Sealer, even though Sealer had a bad game. Like against Ottawa, it was a bad game. And then Tortorella admitted that. In any a, a lot of other teams, they would they would switch up the, the pairings there. They they might even put York on back up on the top line be, on the top pairing because Drysdale hasn't really, you know, worked his way in as far as finding his role defensively yet. And so I think right. that's the thing. And so, yeah, if you can give it a few more games, that's not going to bother me. But I'm just saying there are other um, pairings that you could do here that they're not doing. So they put now they're putting, you know, York with Ristolainen in on a third pair. Okay. I mean, but that's, does York belong on the third pairing? No, he doesn't belong on the third pairing. But he's on the third pairing because you have put Sealer and Walker together on the second pairing and you don't want to really change it. And so that's where, you know, things have changed a little bit in that regard. All right. Well, there's a lot more to talk about with these two games. I want to continue to talk about scoring chances and those defensive pairings. And we are going to do that coming up next. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. On tomorrow's show, it'll be Phantoms Tuesday, where we'll talk about some of those prospects the Flyers could have called up. Uh, plus, we're going to answer your mailbag questions later this week, so get them in. You can email us at LockedOnFlyers at Gmail, send us a message on Twitter, or comment over on YouTube. Uh, Russ, getting back into the weekend, back-to-back uh, -back losses for the Flyers. Um, I, I do want to talk about the lack of quality shot chances mm -hmm. for the Flyers. And uh, John Tortorella talked about that very specifically after the Ottawa game as well and said that, you know, that was the difference, that, you know, his team didn't get enough quality chances and that, you know, he thought that they had played generally okay versus Colorado, even though it didn't work out that that's a different kind of team, but against Ottawa, they just like didn't get enough on the offensive side of things. Well, I mean, sure. So maybe they didn't fight hard enough. I think some of the fight was knocked out of them. I think Ottawa did play pretty physical, uh, much more physical than Colorado did. I mean, Colorado played a little physical, but not, not overly, but you know, you saw that, um, 
when that game was tied with Ottawa that they really uh, they turned it up. And they've yep. been on the same kind of schedule. So it's not like the Flyers are on this unfair schedule of, you know, three out of four or whatever, back-to-backs, that kind of thing. Uh, they turned it up. Like maybe they were a little more desperate. I think that's something that I noticed was they were a little more desperate because, you know, look, right now they're they're the worst team in the league, but they haven't played a lot of games either. There are a lot of games behind based on the way their schedule went. So I think, you know, and Claude Giroux definitely sparked them. I mean, we have to talk about that. That goal that he got um, was a tremendous effort off of what another great effort was when he was on the ground and almost scored one handed. Yeah. So he was willing them back. So that was the thing. Nobody was really leading the Flyers, you know, back to victory on this one. And so that's that was a factor. Like Claude Giroux was a factor. Yeah, it was uh, unfortunate that both Giroux and Zach McEwen scored yeah. in this game. <laughs> Did not enjoy that aspect of it. But yeah, in the game against the Suns, you know, the high danger chances were 17 to 7. And against the Avs, it was 16 to 9. So like pretty similar there. Um, and I think, you know, that was a huge factor that it, it, the Ottawa game, you know, was a little weird with the where's the puck? Did right. they score? You know, throughout yeah. um, a good chunk of that game. But I think that, you know, it was very obvious that both the Avs and the Senators were getting better chance, better scoring chances. Yeah, I mean, you could look it up. You could see it with your eyes. There was no doubt about it. It's definitely something that'll that'll be focused on, but it ha it happened two games in a row. It wasn't just like for this one game, so you don't want it to become a trend. Right, exactly. I think you know I'm not like raising any alarm bells. I'm just saying no. like this is what happened in these two games. Right. Just so it's something to yeah, just like something to think about, and it's something they should take into consideration moving forward. I think they will, given the way John Tortorella talked about it. Uh, mm -hmm. In the post game, because it was, you know, the big difference maker for him. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that aside from that, um, the, yeah, that game against Ottawa was just weird <laughs> the whole time. I, I just thought bizarro things were happening. Um, of course, like it was great for Zamula to get those two goals and especially being heads up on being the only one who knew where the puck was in that first goal. That was a big deal. I mean, that's when you have players that are heavy like that. And, and smart like that, they could really um, help you win. Another factor was Brady Kachuk. The Flyers didn't have anybody to sort of match his will in the crease. He was a guy that even if he wasn't scoring, you saw that he was starting to bother Sam Ursa. And that was, a, that was a thing where the Flyers had no answer for that. And that's where Brady Kachuk could really wear down a goalie with just getting in the crease, jawing at him, taking, you know, shots at him with the stick because the puck's loose. All that stuff, I saw that adding up with Brady Kachuk, especially late in the second, early third. Like that's where Kachuk was sort of thriving, and the Flyers didn't have an answer for that. No, it was getting pretty rough in front of the crease for Urson uh, in, in the game against Ottawa. I think, you know, given who Colorado is, that game was a little more wide open. And so right. I don't think Hart was bothered as much as he was just screened and he was also having to deal with, you know, much more skilled shots overall. You know, and something else that's, you know, of note, um, Jacques Martin was brought in to basically teach the Ottawa players to play better defense. Like, that's what Jacques Martin does, and they did that in this game. And and that was a big victory for Jacques Martin because, you know, things hadn't gone great before this, like, you know, since he's gotten there. Um, but maybe the message on his side is getting through, and that's where, you know, the Flyers needed to sort of, you know, recognize that too. Because that was, you know, Martin, his message got through to his guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we did not get right, or at least sort of didn't predict correctly uh, from our game preview was shot blocking, especially in the game against the Avalanche. I mean, what we said was we think they're going to have to do a lot of shot right. blocking here in order to be successful. And actually, Colorado blocked 28 shots to the Flyers' 12, which is a yeah, huge difference. Yeah, that was surprising that they didn't try and block more. I'm with you. Yeah. Because that's what I thought they needed to do, um, and they didn't do it. I mean, I guess they had a different strategy. 
Yeah. And I wonder whether it was the defensive structure or it was a specific deliberate decision. Like, did the Flyers just not have a chance to block shots because Colorado is fast? Or did they actively decide not to do that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at the tape. I don't want to sound like John here, but on that one, I would have, I would have to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just intrigued by yeah. that. Um, and I also want to touch on special teams here because, you know, the Flyers uh, did not get any power play goals against Colorado. They got two against Ottawa, which was great to see. Um, but also, you know, they gave up a power play goal to Colorado. They did shut down Ottawa there. But even though it didn't feel like the Flyers power play was bad, it just felt like it was like there was some bad timing there with the power plays they were not able to take advantage of. Right. I mean, what were they, two for six against Ottawa? Was that the number? Uh, two for four, actually. Two for four. I mean, look, they're never going to go four for four, but, you know, had they gone right. three for four, it might have really helped them. Uh, this was a better power play game. I think they, you know, they were more jumbled with the extra attacker on the ice again. They just, they yeah. just were not effective at all with the extra attacker. And it's just, I don't know what it's going to take. Like they honestly, they haven't looked good all year with the extra attacker. Now, once in a while they, they've scored some goals, but I would say they've looked more out of place than in place when they put on the extra attacker. And I had no answer for that. Yeah, they, they did it once. And I think we had to like eat some crow on that when we were talking about it specifically. Right. Um, but other than that, for the most part, it has not been, uh, the best thing for them that they just don't have a coordinated offensive attack for six on five. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, I think there were some really good things about these two games, especially against the avalanche. I think their fight was absolutely there. Um, you know, the comeback effort was there. I think they, they suffered in the second half of the back to back, but again, there were some really good things in that game. We just talked about the power play being successful two out of four times. That's tremendous. Yeah, I actually, yeah, do have a um, an answer for the six on five because I saw it once or twice where it looked pretty good when Drysdale was behind the net because he's their best passer now and and really um, can do it on either side. And I feel like if he can get behind the net, that really does make it a lot harder on the goalie because then the goalie has to sort of look on both sides and then you don't know where that pass is going. They they definitely, in my estimation, they don't do that enough. I don't know what you think. Yeah, well, I, uh, I hope the Flyers don't need to use it a lot moving forward, but if they do, we'll definitely keep a closer eye on it and see if they've made any adjustments. In the meantime, it's Monday, so we're bringing back the nemesis of the week that we did not have last week, and we will do that coming up next. The NFL playoffs have been wild, and there's still some time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. Find bets in the new Explore tab. Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub. The best way to find popular parlays and more. Uh, Right now, I would bet the Ravens next week. I just feel like they're the hot team. Uh, go with them on the money line. They'll probably be the underdog. Depends. Depends who wins the next one, but that's the way I would go. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a touchdown. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league, including Locked On NHL. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube to subscribe. Russ, I was not here last Monday, so we did not have a nemesis right. of the week. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about rivalries and risers when we were kind of approaching that road trip. That was really successful for the Flyers. So good to think back to that time uh, when the Flyers uh, went on the road and played quite well. You know, I think for me this week, 
there's a couple of things. It's really just finishing out strong before the all-star break and, and the bye week that goes with it. It's th- when momentum is such a big part of this game, you want to end on a good note. And we're facing the Tampa Bay Lightning, Detroit Red Wings, and Boston Bruins. And these are not easy teams to match up against. And I think that, you know, lessons learned from these couple of games, move on and see what you can do up against uh, these teams this week and finish out strong uh, before the break. Yeah, I, I, I think that's um, that's good. Um, something I would like to see is better ice. The ice was really bad against um, Colorado. I saw three or four guys just wiping out two in the same spot, actually at least two in the same spot. And I even sent out a tweet and others were talking to me about it, how the ice was swallowing up players. So I know it's hard when you have a lot of you know different events, but it's something that I would just like to see. I think it was affecting both sides, at least in the Colorado game. I didn't notice it as much in the Ottawa game, but I, I didn't look for it. When you're there, you kind of noticed um, things like that a little more often than when you're watching it on TV. Yeah, I believe it. Um, ice can be such a, a huge factor and it could be an advantage when it's your home ice and you're used to the little idiosyncrasies uh, about it. Um, but just when it's a little soft, it makes it a little harder to do your usual things and use just pure muscle memory in, in yeah. order to to play well. Um, my My side nemesis this week is the sheer volume at this time of year, for some reason, of Flyers games on NHL Network. And this is no shade to the NHL Network broadcast whatsoever. I don't really have problems with it, per se. It's just, it's it's a patented reminder of the fact that you have to subscribe to yet another, like, some service in right. order to get NHL Network, especially in the age of streaming when You know, it's a very limited number of streaming services that have NHL Network and you always have to pay the ultra super duper sports tier package in order to get it. So just for like these four or five games, whatever it is, but, you know, having three in in a two week period because the game against Boston is also going to be on NHL Network. Um, Not only do you miss out on having your local broadcast, um, which is familiar but, you know, it just reminds you that you're probably paying an extra 12 to $15 a month for <laughs> the game that you're watching that it's day. It's supposed to be in a hockey fan. Yes. Uh, sometimes it can really get to you. But uh, that will do it for today's show. We will be back tomorrow to talk Lehigh Valley Phantoms. And uh, we'll also be talking about the Tampa Bay Lightning, which are going to be a tough opponent to face as well. As a reminder, we always want to hear from you. Send in your mailbag questions via Twitter at Locked On Flyers. You can email us at Locked On Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Have a great day, everyone.